The Living, Breathing Cinema. From the New Machine Cinema. Foundational Essays in AI Film Theory. By Huru Jackson. I truly believe we are moving into a world where audiences are no longer able to weaponize their attention. During the production of Window Seat in 2023, my laptop screen shattered, tethering me to a monitor. I had a deadline for myself and eventually gave it to the Mac store to replace the screen. But something funny happened. I kept generating the movie on my phone through the browser. The realization emerged that the computers aren't a tool anymore. It's the raw information itself, as if we're directing films, psychically tethered to no gear, but existing in a state of pure mental information. I and other AI filmmakers have once described the guilt of how these films appear out of nothing. It feels wrong on a fundamental reality level. The guilt is profound, as I imagine it would feel to suddenly have billions of dollars. What did I do to deserve this? How can I put it to use to help as many people as possible? It would be overwhelming. I believe the guilt is from realizing post-scarcity for the first time. Capitalism devalues art. AI devalues capitalism. It allows us to use their own machines against them. This is all a way of expressing the ephemeral nature of AI cinema. We are playing with toys a part of us subconsciously feels like we shouldn't be allowed to play with because it was, in scarcity era, only available to the rich. There is another symptom we should discuss about the ills of capitalism. That is the new audience and the development of the weaponization of attention, a sort of cancel culture fusion fandom. They have evolved beyond being a mere audience. They want to have an equal voice in the creative process. The film industry stopped connecting, caring, or catering to audiences specifically, but broadly, and in aiming broad, led past the interests of the individual. Audiences bit back. This has led to a toxic culture, which I have experienced personally aimed at me. Odd to me because I have always felt AI is the very solution to every single audience concern. The thing that toxic audiences hate the most is being appeased. Because methods of mass tribal attacks, ridicule, and social violence were extremely successful in resource-scarce models. In post-scarcity, it is merely noise. Why were these methods so effective? Collective toxicity allows society to outsource and distribute violence, much as AI distributes information across its training, to reach the same impact of achieving a result without any one party taking full responsibility. People will be exiled. It is designed to exile them. People will quit. It is designed to make them. People will never make films again. It is designed to send creators into a hole, never to return. But going from Dread Club to Carriage Ride six months later, I immediately realized post-scarcity. In traditional models, with all the institutional attacks I endured, I'd have lost my career, my life. I'd have never made a film again. In post-scarcity, it was merely a jump scare. Cinema is just one head of a far larger hydra, its toxicity boiling well below the beast. In post-scarcity, we can even begin to imagine entirely new forms of post-scarcity. Post-money, post-competition, post-human, the automated film. Every layer on the AI spectrum removed the toxicity of the frustrated audience the consumer at the base level. Misguided as it is to target independent filmmakers, no one faced this more than film studios. Simultaneously, the audience doesn't know what it wants. Simultaneously, its demands are met. The result, disgruntled audiences get even angrier. So, I introduced the living, breathing film as the final solution to the disgruntled audience. In fact, it solves every single one of their qualms. They want an equal say in what happens on screen, and now they have it. One angry minority of the audience can have it their way without angering the other angry minority, who can have it their way too, because now, for the first time in its history, a film need not be locked into a single form. The living, breathing film can exist simultaneously in multiple versions. Traditionally, when a work moves between mediums, novel to film, film to animation, theatre to cinema, we speak of it as an adaptation. Each version becomes its own distinct entity, separated by medium, time, and creative vision. The living, breathing film dissolves these boundaries. 
It exists in multiple forms, simultaneously, each version emerging from the same creative moment, each equally the film. This transcends simple technical transformation. We are not discussing colorization, restoration, or conversion between formats. The living, breathing film is conceived from its inception to exist in multiple complete forms, each with its own artistic integrity, while sharing a unified creative core. Rather than treating alternate versions as deviations from a singular true form, it embraces multiplicity as inherent to the work itself. Each viewer can experience the version that resonates most deeply with their aesthetic preferences. Any version, any how, any way. One click. It will be realised on a spectrum before the ultimate endpoint of automated films. Imagine a writer tasked to create ten different versions of a film that happen in every way while retaining his artistic vision. If an artist can show attention to one work, why can't they show attention to the same work over multiple versions of the same one? Each version will teach us a different lesson. The living, breathing film begins at a spectrum and ends at automated films reverse engineered by algorithms. The automated film is where the market will be flooded with autofilms, and then a random, chaotic consensus emerges. And yet even in the worst case of audience fears, I believe auteurs can emerge from that as well. We already see this with this whole notion of directorial curation. Who remembered Quentin Tarantino Presents? Hero directed by Zhang Yimou. Is this not, in a sense, an automated film? Tarantino's name towers over it, offering we the viewer an entirely different point of view about the film than we would otherwise have. A film is no longer a film. A film is a vinegar syndrome film. The curation affords its own substance, most common and popularized with boutique record presses. In scarcity, the curation, not the art, is the offer of exchange. I would state that absolutely none of this Tarantino presenting, a boutique label offering their name, a critic's curation, has a thing to do with the film itself. The film was always one thing, regardless of any noise around it. But then I would turn around and say, when was it ever about the film to begin with? Cinema was about money, hype, PR, curation, and social proof, with the film itself coming last. Now a bad film alone cannot amplify all these layers. At the same time, the machine seems to function entirely empty of quality input. When capitalism gets its hands on virtue, it is no longer virtue. As AI technology advances, the living, breathing film will evolve from concept to common practice, starting with plain aesthetic decisions and choose your own adventure plot mechanics. But the real wall breaking here is not about the audience's relationship to cinema, it is about the new post-scarcity realm emerging. A realm where everyone can have what they want. Except it won't be real, not in the way we knew real in scarcity models. It will not be automated, it will mold around our very dreams. I am living proof. It allowed me to make films that were not possible to make in the previous reality before it. Not only that, but it protected me. There will be a point that this idea of a single, specific form of cinema told one way will be unwatchably boring. The greatest films in history will now seem no different than the very first silent film. It will all seem like shoddy cardboard. A movie will become like a Rubik's Cube. You can twist it here, there, or any way, and stare into alternate visions of it. You can now play with your films like a Rubik's Cube. Film history is now malleable, but if we can play with our films, the first thing we will do is play with the films of yore. Eventually, there might be no pure cinema of old left, only the best versions of them born from the collective imagination. Fan fiction will become the dominant cinema. Collectors will be forced to compare versions of films to determine who has the real one. People will invent old films that never existed and try to smuggle them into the public record. Classics will be defaced with alternate renditions with such frequency that opposition will defer to this as a formal art form, much like sampling in music. Who wouldn't want to stand side by side with Wells? Consider the beginnings of AI, where it wasn't original works catching on with people, but AI versions of popular franchises. It begins exactly how it ends, with mimicry. 
But the living, breathing film remains a reconceptualization of how we perceive cinema. Even writing about it, it becomes hard to go back to regular films. Remember, none of this was my idea. It was audiences. They wanted a film one way. When studios obliged, they wanted it another way, over and over. Entertainment has turned into something toxic because audiences crave the living, breathing cinema. People don't want to be an audience anymore. They want to be the artist. I bring it back to my own journey, where I made a deal with the cosmos. The cosmos told me, Kuru, you are free to make any film you ever want, any way, any how. I said yes, without even needing to hear the rest of it. But the cosmos went on. Here is the thing. You will Cosmos afforded me my dream at the same time as affording every billion of us, both empowering the dream and devaluing it at once. We will all be too busy making our own to watch each other's films. This is both a tragedy and also the absolute best the universe can offer in post-scarcity. We come to imagine the audience as we know it as a captive audience, seeking relief from the burden of scarcity. Without this burden in post-scarcity, there is no captivity. We will all exist in the state of play forever. That is our job, not to watch, but to play. How unfortunate, how wonderful.